I was just about to ask you, what's the difference between a, between a session wine and a smashable wine? There's no difference. There's a, a, a session is a smash. Welcome to part two of our episode on English wines. If you missed part one, make sure you go back and check it out. In the conclusion of our English wine extravaganza, our guests compare three very different Pinot Noirs and sample a skin contact Ortega from West Wales site. Plus, they discuss the art of standing out amongst the crowd with bottle labeling. We just did a really great tasting in comparison with three different Chardonnays, and I think it's really exciting now that we get to do the same with three English Pinot Noirs. So, uh, uh, Adrian, do you want to take us through the first one? Most of the clones that we make our sparkling wine from are Burgundy, Burgundy clones, mainly from Dijon. Um, this year we had some really, really ripe fruit. Um, there was one patch on our top field where the Pinot Noir, which is 667, which is a Dijon clone, right next door to Chardonnay. Um, they were just kind of developing almost kind of together. Um, and I decided to leave them until the last minute and then make a, a field blend. So this is 85% um, Chardonnay, uh, sorry, 85% Pinot, and then 15% whole bunch Chardonnay. Um, literally just put into a tank, um, indigenous yeast. So and then what, what it's the just runoff, it hasn't been pressed either, so it's just there. So it's 85% Pinot Noir. And 15 Chardonnay. And 15 Chardonnay. Yeah. The Pinot Noir was uh, crushed and destemmed into the tank and the Chardonnay was just added a whole bunch. And then we left it to ferment and then just took the juice off. So it's, it's, I mean, it's really light. Um, I don't know what the alcohol is, but it's not gonna be particularly high. Um, so it's really, lovely. really kind of juicy and fresh. Um, I can't remember if there's any sulfur in it. This is, um, it's straight from tank, so um, see what you think. I don't think I've added any sulfur to it yet. It has a real like confected, Gummy, like, like it's, it's got this really kind of, yeah, really kind of sweet, fruity thing that, um, but I mean, it's had nothing in it at all. Mm. Not as bad, it smells like Kool Aid. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, like, it has a real confected, like, ripe fruit, like, element yeah, to it. It almost has that kind of carbonic thing, but it's, it's had no carbonic maceration at all. Speaking of smashable, right? yeah. Like we're yeah. talking about smashable wines, that's, that's a smashable wine. That's a great, yeah, it's a great barbecue kind of wine. Juicy yeah. cherry. I don't know, I'm really pleased with it. I was kind of, you know, Patrick Sullivan's wines. Um, yeah, I was he makes just a lot thinking of about of it. It's got a lot of red, white blends, and I, but his Bonkers is one of my, my favorites. I think that's got nine different varieties in it, but it's got this kind of real kind of juicy freshness that you get from the white wine blended with the red. So Sullivan, Aussie produ produ producer, yeah? Yeah, 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 that's right. I can imagine that's slightly chilled as well. That's, Maybe, yeah. it should be slightly chilled. Yeah. But it's got this great, I mean, I mean, it's got this bright, crunchy, juicy, kind of like sour cherry personality, but it's also got this kind of like, not funk, but this almost like this earthy personality as well. So, I mean, this would be great barbecue wine. Like, oh, a yeah. little bit chill, like a little bit of kind of like lean grilled meat, just that. Yeah. You can just feel the the vibe if you're drinking this, like having some I think like, it's got some, some, some kind of tannic structure mm -hmm. in there, which I think probably comes mostly from the, from the stems. Again, it hasn't been pressed, so it's not gonna have much coming out from the skins, but um, I think, the whole bunch in there whilst the, the ferment's going on has added some kind of structure. So you, you've had extended maceration the whole time? Yeah. This is, it's funny, so this kind of reminds me in a weird way of um, Frank Cornelison's Contadino, which okay. I used to describe, I used to describe to people that work for me, I was like, like what does it taste? I mean, it tastes like the first girl I kissed who smoked cigarettes. That's how I would, <laughs> that's how I think of it as this kind of like bright cherry fruit, a little bit of ashy character. This is like that girl but not smoking. <laughs> <laughs> Were you smoking as well? No, no, it was, that was, that's why it's such a vivid memory. It was like, whoa, what is all the, what is this? This what is not what, on? kisses wow. don't taste like this. I was an innocent young youth, you know, innocent youth. Um, so as the only non-wine maker here, um, the, I brought the Davenport Diamond Fields Pinot Noir from 2016 along. Um, so I, Obviously, started doing my English wine podcast last year, um, and prior to that, had drunk quite a few English sparkling wines, had drunk quite a few English white wines, and this was the, and I had, uh, drank a couple of English reds, which were kind of Dornfelder and Rondo, which I never really got on board with. Um, and this was the first one where I went, ah, okay, we can we can actually make quite nice red wine uh, in England, quite nice Pinot in England. Um, so yeah, Adrian actually, I didn't know this prior to bringing it, but helped make this wine when you were at Davenport. Yeah, I picked uh, some of the grapes in it and I, I punched it down quite a few times. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know this wine quite well. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I, I love this. I think this is great. This is, uh, this is the last of my, my, my 2016s I had. Um, 
was, yeah, so looking forward to tasting the new ones as well. But you quite tell us a bit more about how it was made and your involvement in it. <laughs> I could do, but I don't want to over-egg my involvement in it. I mean, Will, Will Davenport is a, is a kind of legendary English winemaker who, um, yeah, just doesn't do anything to his wines at all. He basically gets ripe fruit and puts them in a tank and then they end up like this. I mean, this, this was in um, open tops, stainless steel, um, wild ind indigenous yeasts, um, punched down twice a day, I think, um, and then run off into barrels and then left in barrels. All odour, old oak. I mean, most of the oak that um, he uses has had, I don't know, five to 15 years at least, I think. Um, 15 so years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's not a lot of um, oak character obviously in it, but it allows the wine to breathe and develop in that. Um, it's made with um, Pinot Noir Precoche, so Frubegunda, um, which is what they grow in Diamond Fields, um, which gives that kind of darkness to it, I think. Um, slightly different to kind of a standard Pinot. Um, but I mean, I, I love it. I've drunk lots of this wine and I think quite a lot of other people have. I mean, it, it, it sold out pretty much straight away. I like that you describe it as that, that darkness. I mean, it, it has this wonderful, you know, when you say earthy, you kind of try to imply part of it, but darkness is really it. It's just got this depth of kind of a focused kind of um, um, flavor. It's very woodsy, but yeah, without right. feeling too sotto bosco in Italian, right? The, like underbrush, it doesn't have that. It's got a very kind of ripe, firm, deep um, earthiness to it. And I think darkness is kind of a cool way to describe it's, it. It's really developing nicely as well. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's going to keep going for a long time. It's, it's a shame that, that Will's only been making a small amount, but I know he's planted another entire field of, of Pinot Noir. He needs to be making more red wine in England because yeah. he's, a, he's a great winemaker. I think it's, it, it just stands out, stands out for me kind of quite, quite high above kind of a lot of stuff you do drink in England. It doesn't have that kind of as much the underripeness to it, kind of, I don't really get that. It's, it does have that kind of earthiness to it. It's still got some kind of quite developed fruit in there. Um, yeah, I, just, I love this. I think it's fantastic. There's like some sort of like treacle aspect to it. And there, there's, there's a wee bit of oxidative character, which is, which is nice. You know, you, you get a sort of bit of that, the forest floor, bit of the sort of treacle aniseed type thing going on. Um, and then you get the, the, the dried black cherry. It reminds me a lot of like Spätburgunder. Right, in terms of like like how it like, evolves and like the the depth of it, um, but on the palate, it's like super it's super elegant. It's not overly extracted, um, and and it, it sort of you know does it well. Yeah, I mean it, it's really savory. The, the, that's kind of what we're going to show. It is a good one. It kind of has that savory quality that you expect from that. I mean, is it quite a bit of whole cluster? I mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't remember what the percentage was, but there was a lot of whole bunch in there. I, mean, I don't think it was totally whole bunch because we we definitely pressed and destemmed in. But I mean, there would be at least fifteen percent. You of can whole feel bunch that, and you feel the ripeness of it, right? I mean, and that's a thing that I um, I often lament when I'm looking at when I'm tasting New World, whatever style, you know, Pinot. You know, but from a lot of great producers, that sometimes that they're they're forcing that whole cluster character in much warmer regions, but you just feel the unripeness of that cluster yeah. and it can just be a really off-putting green character to me. It's, it's amazing. I mean, I was tasting this one and thinking of the savory character, this dark personality, still some, you know, as you say, some levity, some freshness, but you're just like, oh, sh fuck, I'm tasting an English Pinot. It's like a really ripe yeah. cluster, right? So it's, um, it, it's quite a, it's a bit of a revelation. You forget it's a, what you're it's tasting. It's a seriously good wine. That it's, it's just talking about whole cluster. You know, you go back to Burgundy 30, 40 years ago, everything was 100 percent whole cluster because, <laughs> And that's why Burgundy is so unaccessible for, you know, decades. You know, it took you know, you buy you buy wine in like, call it 1990, right? So that we're just going back 30 years. But 1990 was an epic vintage. Those wines are just now becoming accessible. And you go back further to the 70s, to 77, 75, or, or 71. Those those wines like were untouchable. They're completely undrinkable for the first like 15 years of their life. And I've, I've been really fortunate enough to try some of those wines from great producers. And, you know, and within the past five, 10 years, they're now just really like open and honest and they're not gonna, you know, tear down the house with and like be super challenging, <laughs> if that makes all sense. Um, I, I, I love whole cluster on the whole, you know, so I think in particular Pinot Noir does really well with it, Syrah does really well with it. Um, so if, if, if you can, so going back to the ripeness level of, of, mm. of the, the whole yeah. cluster, right? So how do, you, how, do you, how do you judge whole cluster involvement? Um, for all of our still Ortega, we just, we press a whole bunch. The only, the only thing that we de-stem is the Pinot. 
So Josh, why don't you, tell us, about, I mean, you have, you've got an, your own English wine podcast. Um, you've done six episodes. Tell me, like, what inspired you to do that and kind of how did that come about? Yeah, uh, so I think basically kind of start of last year, um, beginning of 2018, did WSCT level two. And that was my kind of like jumping off point from wine being something I drank to being a bit of an obsession. And um, read about all these wine regions, you know, kind of, and drank little bits of kind of Burgundy or Bordeaux and other places in the world and thought that sounds great and I, I love all of that but it seems quite intimidating to get into um, I think kind of the cost as well is just so like high to kind of get into that like recognizing different parts of um, Burgundy for example and I thought well, what's on the doorstep England's here and there's kind of lots of you know it's, it's kind of it's beginning to be hot like kind of last March March April time um, and kind of thought, thought what should I do what can I do? Where the kind of skills lie? I thought I don't have any skills in podcasting. I listen to some podcasts. Maybe I'll try and do one of those. Um, so basically, yeah, kind of last beginning of last summer, emailed about 30, 40 people. Um, uh, two of these guys were two of these two, two of those guys, and um, yeah, managed to kind of beg them and borrow my way into people's vineyards and wineries and interview them as a process. And I kind of did the whole thing as a initially try and see if it was going to be a, a kind of regional style kind of did a Sussex episode and a Kent episode and a Surrey episode and kind of grouped it together like that learned during the course of those six episodes that wasn't really the case and I think as Sergio said it's far more site specific than that there's kind of sites in some places which are really stand out and that doesn't mean that you know half a mile down the road is going to be that in England um but yeah got to got to meet loads of people as part of that process um and yeah kind of produced six episodes which finished last week is the first series, which is officially the first series, um, though maybe a second. Um, I've had far more people now get in touch, having seen I'm not just some wild horse trying to knock on their door going, can I come and drink some free wine? Are you not? I mean, uh, that's... <laughs> well, I still am, but yeah. He's a lunatic with the microphone, he's just a lunatic, lunatic with credibility with yeah, the microphone. Yeah, I've got a bit more credibility now. If I don't have this Shit. setup, I was literally just one mic microphone turning up and like, can I interview you, is that okay? Um, and everyone said yes, so that was good fun. Sergio, the final, the grand finale uh, Pinot of the of the trip. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? So um, this is comes from the same vineyard as our Chardonnay, and um, as I mentioned, uh, this also our uh, this also comes from Burgundy clones. So it's one one five and triple seven, which are widely planted throughout the world. One one five being the the smaller, more concentrated bunches. Triple seven is effectively the workhorse. Um, so if you look at California, New Zealand. Um, even in, in some of the newer plantings in Burgundy, triple seven is more of a filler. It's larger bunches, more juice, et cetera, better color extraction. Um, but that's a, effectively a 50-50 blend of those clones in, in this wine. Um, and with us, we, we find the whole sort of theme of, of naming the wines. We call this night jar, and the bow tie is from the Facade Natural History Museum. So this effectively embodies nature. The Chardonnay embodies art. Um, and the uh, Silva bubbles uh, embodied my, uh, really my enjoyment. Um, so with this in mind, um, like sort of bits of the previous two Pinots, this has 25% whole cluster. Um, I, uh, it's a funny story about this. So in 2017, my tanks didn't arrive on time. My fruit came before my tanks. Uh, my tanks arrived three days later. Um, so we basically knocked the heads off some barriques, some 228 liter barrels, um, threw 1,000 kilos of fruit in there, 25% um, were your whole cluster, so that went on the bottom, and then I would destemmer and destem the fruit on top, and that made up this wine. Um, the rest of the uh, 1.2 tons of fruit went into my press for the rosé, um, because I had nowhere else to put it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this, we never intended to make rosé, but this is the result of a smaller individual ferment. So to give you context, larger ferments get warmer, just of the kinetic energy. Um, these are very small ferments, so it never got super hot, hence why the color is very sort of pale-esque in, in, in its own right. So, you know, it never got warmer than 22 degrees. It was all hand punched down. 
um, indigenous fermentations um, as are the rest. Um, no sulfur at pressing or, or, or anything like that. Uh, and then which it went into um, five to 10 year old burgundy barrels um, for three, for seven months. And then like the Chardonnay, it was unfiltered and fine and bottled in July. So there, there we have it. Very cool. Necessity is the mother of invention, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Fruits here, wine's ready. <laughs> what are we going to do? Well, th this, this is, I call this a session wine. It's 11% alcohol and effectively it's, it's just a smash. This is truly the essence of a smashable wine. I was just about to ask you, what's the difference between a, between a, session, a session wine and a smashable wine? There's no difference. There's a, a, a session is a smash. <laughs> What do you all think? I love this. I, I think I'm, I said to you when we were off, off mic, um, yeah, I think it's great. I've, I've drank a few bottles of this. This is the first of the uh, English reds a few of my friends have drank when I put it at the dinner party recently. They all really liked it. Amazed at the color of it. I think it's one of you know, the lightest reds a lot of people are seeing. I think especially if you haven't kind of come across a lot of um, quite cool climate red wine making you'll be really surprised at kind of this color of this because it is it's a really beautiful color but it's like so almost translucent in that kind of in that red way well i wanted to ask you about the labels who does the artwork i mean they're very inspired labels is it do you guys do it yourselves you conceptualize it or who? um uh we are not that talented is a short answer to that well our thoughts were is that having looked at you know i hate to sort of pick on will here but you know will's will's label or Chapel Downs or, or Gus Burn, they're all very traditional labels. You know, our thought process, why will we look, why do we want to look like everyone else? Right. Um, and so with that in mind, our, from, the, from the start, we want to be a bit more contemporary, we want to represent the city that we live in. And so we enlisted the help of the Central St. Martin graduates um, called the Yarza Twins. And they're, they're really abstract and quite sort of outside the box and they had no experience with drinks business um, or wine labels. And that was, that was a plus for us. So we enlisted their help and collectively came together with um, our core range series, which is um, what we've, we've referred to as the faces of Londoners. So they're all sort of these, these faces that represent the uh, different um, cultural aspects of London, but also different demographics. And each one has a subtle nod to the city that we live and that we love. Um, and hence why I, I sort of made the, the, the context and the, the effort of saying each one. And, and, and they are really uh, a massive help in, in giving our brand identity, but also helping us with our, our labels as well. There's so many wines on the market that it's, and, and, and Adrian's labels are, are, are pretty wicked and we'll, we'll see if there's orange wine as well, but. You have to work on something which is kind of related to what you're making, don't you? And there, you need to find a way of standing out, I think. There is, yeah, and, but we, you don't really want to be gimmicky, right? No, exactly. So, so for us, part of our whole sort of deal is to be sustainable, so we don't have caps, we don't have wax. Um, we, you know, also selfishly, I like skinless bottles. I like, you know, going, working all these harvests and going to like people's cellars and just pulling out a blank bottle with a bit of sort of white chalk scribble on it, having no idea what it is, yeah. just going, this seems like a good choice. <laughs> right. I'll, ha I'll have this. Might as well just have a question mark on it. It's like, that's yeah. for dinner. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. And, and this is beyond sort of, you know, it's the telling exactly what the cuvee is on the, on the cork, where it is. There's no like brandy on the cork. This is you literally pull out a bottle. I really enjoy that. I think there's a real romance behind it. And I think um, it, as, as a winemaker going to another winemaker's cellar, and they're like, just choose what you want. And you go, and they get, they, basically the response is after your choice, I have no idea what this is. Let's find it out. Yeah, yeah. And it happened, so I worked at De Monti, and it happened that like, we pulled like a 1968-ish bottle right. out from the cellar, and they're like, we have no idea where, when it's from. And it's it's like, from this era in this corner of yeah, the cellar. It's within like this like 10 year point. Yeah. And you go, okay. That sounds fantastic. Let's, let's dive into it. And there's real beauty behind that, so. So Adrian, I'm, I'm, I'm always quite reticent to be too effusive about a wine 
pack about wine packaging in general, but I can't I can't help but be captivated by um, the label, the artwork, and just the general sophistication of this package. So the expectations are high. But why don't you tell us a little bit about the the this bonus bottle that you brought this uh, Ortega? So basically, for. the um, all of our new wine labels have got something to do with the vineyard. So this has got the that's a picture from the soil that was then hand drawn in pen and ink um, by my wife. Um, so we've got this one, which is the soil. We've also got one, which is uh, a cut through our Ortega. So we took a piece of the vine wood after pruning, cut through it, put it underneath a microscope. So it shows the skin cells within the, and then did a pen and ink drawing of that. Um, our pink, which is launching in a couple of weeks, is going to be, um, there's a Westwell pink, which is a, an, an, an anemone, um, a, you know, a pink flower, which actually grew and was discovered just above the vineyard. Um, so she's done a, a pen and ink drawing of those, and we're going to have that on our rosé label. So it's all related to the vineyard. That's the idea, just to bring it back. Um, do you want to try it? Absolutely. So this is um, Ortega Skin Contact, um, indigenous yeast, uh, fermented and left for three weeks, um, and then aged in amphora for eight months afterwards. And skins? Yeah. Incredibly aromatic. Yeah, it smells very good. Yeah, it's really unusual. Um, it, it, it changed so much, and, and actually this is, is completely different. Um, originally, you got the honeysuckle from the amphora. So the amphora is a 500-litre terracotta pot, um, which is made by uh, Artanova in Italy, who make, um, they make uh, amphora for Elisabetta Foradori and Jacques Salos. Um, and it kind of, it just really adds something in the ageing. It, it's somewhere between a barrel and stainless in that it gets some kind of breathing and it allows some kind of oxygenation, but not too much. Um, but it really develops the flavours inside it. I think it kind of continually moves around. Um, but I think this has got some real um, kind of savoury notes. It's got like a kind of real wild thyme and fennel thing on the finish. I don't know, what do you think? I think it's amazing. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, like, it's, I mean, obviously it's got a lot of texture. It's got a botanic structure. It's incredibly ethereal and perfumed, but really finesse on the palate. You can, it's low alcohol. It's just a really elegant, delicate, but expressive wine. It's got a bit of like kind of peach Haribo <laughs> like kind of character. It's a bit Moorish as well, yeah, yeah. you know, it which is, we, 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 is really good. It's kind of unusual where you'd place it in terms of eating it with a meal, but I kind of come to the conclusion that it's, it's really great with cheese. Go really great with Haribo. Yeah. Yeah. at the end and... Yeah. I think after 12 of the wines, it places quite well. Mm. Yeah, that, that's when it's habit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, with some really fresh, like some fresh kind of goat's cheeses or some like yeah, really yeah, nice, yeah. like a lot of texture. Comte is really good. Sorry. I, I, well, I was just going to add to that in, in the fact that in terms of the palate, right? So the palate is not what you expect out of an orange wine. It actually has for, for, for three weeks skin contact plus like extended and four, like yeah. that, that oxidative character, that the microoxygenation that happens within the four you know, adds a real lovely softness and, and obviously that's from polymerization, right? So it's all the tannin structures just being rounded and softened like through that, through that Yeah, bit. it's getting less and less. The, the, the tannin after three weeks on skins with the Ortega is really quite fierce. But then it, it just, it becomes really gentle, the amphora. Yeah. And then you start to get this kind of thing coming through in the mid palate as well. You start to get the fruit in there. And the length is like super and there's like structure. No, I mean, I did a bit of skin contact Ortega this year in sort of, okay. in sort of uh, half ton bins, mm. um, and the, the tannins were about a lot more prevalent. Yeah, they, you know? they're, they're really fierce initially, but I mean, obviously this is 2017, so it's had quite a while now. No, but it's, um, it's, 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 I, I agree with Derek, and it's, 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 a, it's a real super wine. If you've had the pleasure to visit uh, Elizabeth's wineries, and you, if you, you know, I have great reverence for her wine. She's one of my, the most inspiring winemakers for me in the world. I remember the first time I went to her winery and I tasted out of the M4 of her wines and they were so pure out of M4 and I was perplexed by the fact that that um, purity was kind of transferred into the bottle as well. Um, and you kind of get that same purity here and I think that's what's, I don't, I don't quite know how to articulate it. It's totally unfiltered, sure but, I mean, but it's, if, uh, if, you, if you leave the bottle, there's a lot of sediment in there. The best thing I think to do is just to shake it up and blend it in with the wine, kind of emulsify it and then pour it and you get that kind of flavour in there. And I think that keeps some of it too. I mean, it's just, we were thinking about filtering it because I mean, obviously there was loads of stuff in, in the amphora, including all the skins and lots of stuff that had settled. And we just bottled the whole lot really. 
But I mean, for me, it's Ortega. It's, um, it's one of the reasons why we bought the Westwell site is that they've got four acres of Ortega. Ortega crops really beautifully in the UK, gets really, really ripe. You get all these amazing flavors, but it's kind of like a winemaker's dream. You can do all sorts of different things with it. So it lends itself to kind of skin contacts because it's got some lovely flavor in the skins. But our, our still Ortega is a really kind of, it's quite a kind of lean, kind of fresh, kind of, you know, kind of, it's not really, um, it hasn't developed all of those kind of orangey, marmalade flavors you get. We kind of kept it really kind of clean because we wanted to make a kind of refreshing wine. Ortega has this ability to get really kind of bitter because it's got this kind of pith finish. But that works great in, in skin contact because then as you age it in amphora, you kind of lose that, but you keep the kind of orangey, marmalade flavors and you start to get the savoriness. So it's, um, it's, just, it's just such a great grape to grow in England as well because you, you need to have grapes which will grow and get some real ripeness and some real flavors but also retain some acidity. And the problem we kind of have here is if you get really, really ripe fruit, your acidity drops completely. So I know there's lots of stuff about um, you know, English wines having too much acidity, but that's because people pick because they want to try and retain some of it. And if you leave it to get really, really ripe, it falls out. Whereas Ortega just seems to mix, kind of hit this right spot. For me, it's the real kind of, there's the, the Bacchus Ortega thing in England at the moment. You've got your Bacchus and you've got your kind of elderflower and your grass, and it's really kind of, I don't know, Sauvignon Blanc-esque for the uh, lazy kind of description. Whereas Ortega, I think, has got so much more to, to offer. Um, you can just do lots of different things with it. But, and that's why we did this, really. Guys, thanks so much for coming tonight. This is a really exciting evening together with a um, massively diverse spread of wines. And, and um, um, really appreciate you all taking the time to come down. And thank you to everybody at Terroir for hosting us here in uh, uh, just off Trafalgar Square. And I uh, um, hope that people listening and watching get to see a bit more of the English wine world than maybe they previously thought. So um, cheers to you guys. Cheers to your wine. Thank, thank you. you.